This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Thank you. A house full of philosophers, no one can figure out how to turn it on, certainly including myself, clearly. Um, I want to warmly welcome you. I'm the graduate dean, Marianne Mason, and it's the graduate division and graduate council that sponsor these lectures. Uh, and I apologize for not being here yesterday. I was uh, on the road. But it's my pleasure to welcome you, and I had a chance to talk to Professor Cavell, so I know you're in for yet another treat this afternoon. But I also want to tell you a little bit about how these lectures came to be, because uh, at Berkeley, we care about our history. We have a rich history, and this is one of the rich parts, the public lectures that we can offer. Oh, and by the way, I have to put in a little plug here. Would you please sign your, your little purple form that says how you heard about us? Because we want these lectures to be ever more public than they are now. And clearly, there are a lot of people who know about it. Um, the Howison Lectures in Philosophy were established at the University of California in 1919 as a memorial to Professor George Holmes Howison by certain of his friends, many of whom had also been his students. You can't help but think this is a wonderful thing to have done to someone who made an influence on your life. In their request, the donors wrote, Quote, Professor Howison held the reasoned conviction that this, would, that this world, to its very depth, is kindred to the human spirit, that it is a community of free persons, finite and infinite, sustained by the vision of the perfect, with a capital P. And all his great powers were directed to awaken in others a loyalty to these ideas. And those, it would seem, could speak most from a foundation in his memory who were able to share with him this high purpose and condition and conviction. It's a wonderful tribute for students to give to a professor. And uh, I'm very, very happy to be able to use this lecture series to invite our distinguished lecturer today, Professor Cavell. And uh, I'm uh, looking forward to this lecture. And Professor uh, Waltham, you're going to say a couple of words, please? Thank you. I think I um, missed my opportunity. Uh, yesterday, of course, there was a great deal more that I could have said about Professor Cavell, but time was short, and I simply can store it up in myself. But I hope that you all notice one thing, how what I talked about is the voice, how that voice resounded through the absence of the voice. Thank you very much. Just what I wanted to hear. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> now, if I grow completely silent, it will be completely filled, we hope. Hello again. Nice of you to come again. My title for today, The Wittgenstein in Event, speaks of a philosophical event associated with a man's name. I mean it to mark an intervention in intellectual culture that manifests two characteristics chiefly. First, it has had the power to change for some how they conceive the possibilities and necessities of philosophy, while at the same time it has left others uninterested, unless interested to deny that a work like Philosophical Investigations adds up to a very serious, let alone indispensable, philosophy at all. Second, having said in my first lecture that I recognize the intervention as decisive in my own case, which is what I'm going to talk about mostly today, I mean to leave open how large a change the event may represent in our intellectual culture more broadly. Whether it amounts to what Wittgenstein calls a great separation, Wittgenstein said of 
uh, the effect of his work that it shows that there's a kink in human history. Uh, bearing in mind, as Nietzsche would have had in mind um, at the end of his untimely meditation on Schopenhauer, words from Emerson's essay, Circles, quoting Emerson, a new, that Nietzsche quotes, so who am I quoting? A new degree of culture would instantly revolutionize the entire system of human pursuits. Perhaps that should be read, a new degree, one new degree of culture would instantly revolutionize the entire system of human pursuits. And I have to ask, because um, Wittgenstein says you don't, it could be said that you don't hear your own voice. I think there's some difficulty about hearing in the back of the room, I think some is. Can we do anything about this? Um, <laughs> they're not hearing, you're not hearing in the back of the room. Oh, awful. Oh, this is mine, all right. Um, so these must be connected somehow. What did he is just do? Take it closer now. There's nothing, nothing doing. Oh, this one is doing. Yeah, but that's... Now, if I, how's that? It's better. But not yesterday. It was perfect. Everybody smiled. Everybody raised hand. So these are dead now. No, these are all working. I see. So I'm asking how big a change Wittgenstein's intervention in human culture, more broadly than strictly within professional philosophy, has been or can be said to be. <clears throat> Should we say, I'm asking, that it amounts to a, what Nietzsche calls a separation, perceives as a separation in culture? Or should we take to heart, rather, the epigraph Wittgenstein gave gives to philosophical investigations, namely, it is generally the nature of progress to look greater than it really is. This is almost a dare, that epigraph, to look at what might, what might be called the style of Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, uh, which is the only work of his that I'll be considering in what follows. The text seems to do what it can, to make itself at once attractive and uninheritable within professional philosophy. This is perhaps a way to characterize its seductiveness, an admirable philosophical feature for some, for others deplorable. It is in this light hardly surprising that philosophical investigations has no systematic pedagogy unargumentatively associated with it which is to say that it has no secure place in the current dispensations of academic philosophical instruction. It sometimes seems imaginable to me that philosophical investigations will come to be thought of as belonging to a more or less honorable line of counter-philosophical works whose palpable philosophical eccentricity assures their marginality to a central philosophical curriculum. Along perhaps with Montaigne's essays or Emerson's essays, or Pascal's Pensee, or Rousseau's Promenade, or Schlegel, Friedrich Schlegel's Fragments, uh, or Kierkegaard's Philosophical Fragments, or Nietzsche's Arthustra, works ineradicably tinged with the philosophical, whose life, nevertheless, largely depends upon their interesting those beyond the call of professional philosophy. Such a development would, to my mind, lose a singular feature of Wittgenstein's later work, most famous from the investigation, a feature of unfailing fascination for me, which is precisely its demand for an existence at once, inside uh, and outside the profession of philosophy. The specification at once is critical of me in this formulation. It declares that the work's fascination is missed if one seeks 
to keep the palpably philosophical stretches concerned with problems of meaning, reference, understanding, states of consciousness, language games, grammar, and so forth, apart from the patently and unembarrassed literary's responses to itself, where we are asked to consider such matters as a fly trapped in a bottle, a beetle in a box, talk from a lion, teeth in a rose. I have since my first essay on Wittgenstein, published just 40 years ago, insisted on his remarkable presentation of his philosophizing as internal to his teaching, and it is perhaps primarily because of the persistence of this insistence, trying actually to specify what that means in my way of treating it, that I am sometimes called by the friendly and the not so friendly, an alternative voice in the interpretation, alternative voice in the interpretation of later Wittgenstein, hence to that extent if it matters elsewhere in philosophy. For some years, I could take a rueful pleasure in such a description of the work I do, but as pleasure in the description faded, it was replaced by perplexity. What are the further contours of this sense of an alternative? What difference or set of differences has threatened my welcome within a communal effort? If I'm ever to take the measure of this threat, at least to go over the range of sketches that I've given of stretches of Wittgenstein's investigations and see how they add up or what they add up to, if anything, there is clearly at my age no time like the present. I begin by reassuring myself that the idea of an alternative implies some measure of commonality, as of different paths to a similar goal or similar vehicles to different goals. For example, I have to assume that the claims that I've urged about the relation of Wittgensteinian criteria to the idea of the ordinary and to a companion idea of skepticism, however different in conclusion from other views, is recognizable as philosophically companionable work. And I should expect something of the same is true of issues about Wittgenstein's not advancing theses and destroying everything of interest and importance and about nonsense. I know that the emphatic and recurrent attention that I give to the idea of the ordinary or everyday in Wittgenstein seems to some excessive. And perhaps that suggests a place to begin a specification of my differences as I imagine them. One philosophical friend and influential admirer of Wittgenstein's felt impelled from time to time to remind over the decades, to remind me forcibly that Wittgenstein is not an ordinary language philosopher. For me, this essentially means that he's not a philosopher in the mold of J.L. Austin, something I too have repeatedly affirmed. I mean that he's not. Yet I find intersections between passages in texts of Austin's that I care about and passages of the investigations that prompt me to want to articulate their differences. <clears throat> For example, Wittgenstein saying, what we do is to bring, or more literally lead, words back from their metaphysical to their everyday use could almost be said of Austin's practice, except that Austin had no announced conception and no patience with the metaphysical in this or any other guise. Hence, no interest in tracing the philosophical or, say, the human craving for the metaphysical. This interest has come to seem to me one of the most revelatory of the affinities of philosophical investigations with the vision of the critique of pure reason in Kant's sense of the implacable restlessness of the human, its distinguished faculty of reason as precisely the faculty that tantalizes itself. The associated difference from Kant is Wittgenstein's convictions might put the matter that no system of concepts, called this a philosophical theory, could as it were establish reliable retreats from or limit limits which define this restlessness. 
I don't know how that conviction might be proven. I should think Wittgenstein's affinity here is with Schopenhauer's identification of the will as the thing in itself, to be vanquished only by itself. Wittgenstein gives very little direct development of the concept of the ordinary or everyday use of language, but without the concept, his greater development or portraiture of the metaphysical in language could not be undertaken. I have suggested that he is as or more accurately described as a philosopher of metaphysical as of ordinary language. He spends more time characterizing it. The ordinary occurs essentially in philosophical investigations is what the metaphysical denies or would transcend, as it were a fictional place produced in retrospect, to use a concept of Freud's, by philosophy's flight from everyday ungroundedness or prejudices or fixations. I'm alluding here again, as I did yesterday, to Plato's cave as a figure for the ordinary, the place philosophy begins and to which, unlike the aspiration of much of subsequent philosophy, it, so to speak, returns. There is a momentary, uncharacteristic outburst in Austin's essay, Other Minds, tremendously influential work, at which Austin laments, quoting him, the original sin by which the philosopher casts himself out from the garden of the world we live in, unquote. While this seems to capture something of Wittgenstein's sense of philosophy's drive to speak outside language games, outside secure sense, and in effect confesses Austin's, even his, sharing of romanticism's obsession with the myth of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, it issues in no serious wish to understand philosophy's perpetual self-defeat. Beyond, Austin does, accusing it of such qualities as laziness, drunkenness, wiliness, and morally suspicious claims to, prof to profundity. Philosophical investigations, by contrast, at a certain point, comes upon what I think of as a counter-myth to that of Eden, a counter-interpretation of our present condition, whether it's found or whether it's lost by philosophy, meant at once to recognize the repetitive force of our temptation to leave it, as if our ordinary lives are limitations or compromises of the human, and at the same time to indicate how following the temptation will lead to grief. This counter myth runs as follows, section 107 of Philosophical Investigations. We have got onto slippery ice where there is no friction, and so in a certain sense, the conditions are ideal. But also, just because of that, we are unable to walk. How dangerous a consequence for Wittgenstein does the inability to walk signify? Walking is listed among the handful of capacities that the investigation cites as parts of our natural history, section 25, along with commanding, questioning, recounting, chatting, eating, drinking, playing. So that finding or making ourselves unable to walk, as it were, unearthing ourselves, would represent a breach in our natural history. Call it the natural history of the human, not unlike what Heidegger, for example, in the essay, The Thing, calls the conditionedness of the human, something that presumably may be lost or denied, conditionedness being a pun for the human being causing itself thoughtfulness and a thoughtfulness which is repressed. Then how dangerous a loss would a break in our natural history signify? We might try imagining our response to one who begins regularly to move through rooms and along sunny sidewalks as though they were fields of ice or paths along a precipice. Someone flailing down empty streets, huddling against the signs of sable buildings, and who all the while insists that she or he is going on in the same way as she's always done, moving along straight lines. What's the problem? 
is finding some accommodation here more or less urgent than in the case of the pupil Wittgenstein imagines, of whom he considers, we might say, section 185, it comes natural to such a person to understand our order ad to, as we should understand the order, ad to up to 1,000, 4 up to 2,000, 6 up to 3,000, and so on, a famous passage of Wittgenstein's, contested passage. I am, of course, taking the description unable to walk to describe not some specific failure, but what the investigations elsewhere calls a symbolical expression, which is really a mythological description. Presumably, in this case, signifying something about our inability to move ourselves in accordance with our apparent desires, instead falling all over ourselves. Such symbolical expressions are in place where we're trying to make sense of our efforts to make sense of our lives, and are led to utterances such as an accounting for the practice of following a rule, all the steps are already taken to 19, which Wittgenstein understands as a gesture in which you have said how it strikes you. That's what a myth creates in you. To which he thereupon pays attention. How does it strike? In mythologizing our requirement for an ideal order of language as a wish to inhabit a medium other than one with human grounding that supports the human gait of walking, the danger of the consequence is no less than the danger of our becoming unable to recount or question or play or eat or drink, which is to say, unable to express ourselves or to nourish ourselves by breaking bread with others, having left our natural history. Does this suggest that our grounding in the world is weak because our ground is unsurveyably vulnerable to our capacity for dissatisfaction with ourselves? Or that it's strong because we could not or would not wish to go so far as to destroy the grounds of our existence, our natural history? Wittgenstein ends this counter-myth of escape as from a false perfection by exclaiming, back to the rough ground. It's a symbolical expression of what he's described as returning words from their metaphysical to their everyday use. If so, then I might further specify my difference in understanding the importance of the ordinary or everyday in the investigations by noting that the more literal expression about returning words to their everyday use is a gloss on his having just insisted, when philosophers use a word and try to grasp the essence of the thing, one must always ask oneself, is the word ever actually used in this way in the language game which is its original home. And quote, a remark in which, in turn, I find further clauses in a mythology of human restlessness or strife. This is perhaps harder to see in the published English translation, which I would modify to read, is the word, in fact, so used in the language, not language game, which is its native land? Since Heimat in the German text is a striking thought, and since Wittgenstein here writes Sprache, not Sprachspiel, then the picture we get is not of the philosopher as not playing the game of the ordinary, to which many have wished to respond. Perhaps he has a good reason not to. I've responded so. But rather as casting his words into exile out of their high mark. Casting, that is, our words. Wittgenstein's philosopher, in contrast with Austin's, is less some clearly identifiable theorist than any one of us stopped by perplexity, entangled in her or his thoughts. We do not enter adulthood as Socrates, but perhaps as one stunned at the failure of our assertions to convince Socrates, so that we do not know to what extent our ordinary or, say, unexamined lives are spent in exile 
do not know to what extent these unexamined lives are spent in exile from our expressions. Other philosophers, Emerson among them, have spoken of our living as aliens, or rather as an alienation from our thoughts. Kierkegaard says we live as if we're out, meaning not at home. Wittgenstein will add, not at work. It's an obvious continuation of this mythological register to speak of leading words back and to urge us to get ourselves back to rough ground. What this specifically assumes as an allegory, let me also call it, of the act of invoking a language game or of remembering an ordinary use of the word is that we have already been at the place we are trying to get to. Philosophy has no other. Don't we already know, for example, from our everyday experience, that if I say, for example, I know how he feels about this only from what he tells me and what less he shows me, my reservation only suggests my sense that he's withholding something from me and implies that I have, in this case, no independent means of knowing what that is. For example, no other informant and no better way of observing matters for myself. So when Wittgenstein objects, objects to the philosophical assertion that we know others only from their behavior, or rather attempts us to get to see that this is a philosophically forced assertion, he's asking us to question whether we wish to stand behind the sense that there is something the other is always necessarily withholding from us, and the implication that all I have is, in all cases, no independent means of knowing what that is. And if we wish to say that this is undisguised nonsense, since all that necessarily withholding and no independent means of knowing could at most mean here, as about us all the time with respect to one another, is he is he and I am I. Then we will want to understand what drives philosophy into nonsense. And if it is this easy to be exiled, what is or was our life in our supposed native land? And what would it mean to return to it? <clears throat> I know that the myth of leading words back, we haven't interpreted leading here as if words were alive and had to be guided or enticed. Registering the welcome idea that we return words to the circulation of language rather than keep them fixated in some imaginary service does not so far capture the sense of having in this process to reverse ourselves. This is brought out in the thought, not of return, but of turn, as when Wittgenstein says, our investigation must be turned, but pivoted around our real need. But then the addition of real need has to make its own contribution to mythology, to the characterization of our everyday existence, seen from the perspective of philosophy. It adds to the idea of this existence as exile that it is characterized by false needs or false necessities, as when Wittgenstein cautions or demands, don't say there must be something common or they would not be called games, but look and see. But now a vision of human life as distorted by false necessities links philosophical investigations with opening preoccupations of Plato's Republic, Rousseau's social contract, Thoreau's Walden, Marx's capital, and perhaps suggests a way to respond to the feeling, one I have not tried very hard to protect against, that have already made too much of Wittgenstein's enticing metaphysical, or sorry, metaphilosophical remarks about mythological descriptions and symbolical expressions in emphasizing what are, after all, 
only a few patently literary passages out of all proportion to the actual philosophical work of the investigations. Evidently, my sense on the contrary is that what Wittgenstein specifies as the mythological is part of his providing some perspective precisely on what his philosophical work is, why he takes its importance to be, why it's difficult the way it is, why it takes the form it has, why it's elusive the way it is. And I'm taking the objection to provide that perspective as internal to or called for by what that work is. In saying that it is called for, I mean to imply that the call may, with reason, be questioned, that one need not take the passages I emphasize to heart as I do, which is a way of repeating what I urged at the outset, that the work of the investigations is, and should be, professionalizable. It is a work that can readily seem Sorry, it is work, it's work, the work of that text, can readily seem too trivial to mention. Bethinking ourselves of what we say when and how that is possible, creating cases of particular kinds that Wittgenstein says uh, in, about in language games. It's sometimes hard to do this, why it becomes necessary to do this. And then all at once, these procedures can seem to require a response of particular urgency, as if speaking to a sense of moral, even as Wittgenstein once said to a student of his, religious perplexity. As though the philosophical or like it, as though the philosophical questioning of the use of a word epitomizes in its apparent perplexity, sorry, in its apparent triviality, and in our resistance to the apparent triviality, a chronic sense that our lives are in question and as such require turning. In the investigations, philosophy occurs in the aftermath of small, repetitive crises to which the creature of finitude is chronically subject, the creature burdened by, can we say, thoughts of the infinite, when Wittgenstein turns upon himself to ask, where does our investigation get its importance from, since it seems only to destroy everything interesting, that is, all that is great and important? He adds parenthetically, as it were, all the buildings, leaving behind only bits of stone and rubble, thus drawing out in order to bring to attention that this impression of falling buildings and rubble is our fantasy. No buildings have been destroyed. Things remain as they were. But we, in response to trivial requests for saying what we know, but do not know how to value, we are devastated. This is how a change in our sense of what is interesting, great, important, can in the moment make us feel. Shouldn't we ask for something in return? Some liberation, perhaps? But do we trust ourselves to know what liberation looks like? I might summarize what I've been saying about my interest in the ordinary. I mean about its being that to which we are to turn, or turn again, by saying that the investigations portrays our lives with their little outbreaks of frenzy or madness as something extraordinary, strange, in a sense, unnatural. It is this I was responding to in my first book, Must We Mean What We Say, by including in it an essay on Beckett's endgame, uh, which at one point Beckett contrasts, sorry, which at one point in my book, in my uh, essay on Beckett, contrasts Beckett's sense of the ordinariness of the extraordinary with Chekhov's portraits of the extraordinariness of the ordinary, in each case marveling at what we, with our cursed and blessed capacity for adaptation or conformity, might think either ordinary or out of the ordinary. When Wittgenstein remarks, for example, a philosophical problem has the form, I don't know my way about, I understand him continuing his insistence that philosophy does not seek to teach us anything new. 
to imply that philosophy does not move us from ignorance to knowledge, but from confusion or chaos to order or clarity, from being lost to finding ourselves, and that the first step of the philosophical answer to a philosophical problem is to demonstrate to us that we are indeed lost, confused, chaotic, even when we think of ourselves as full of conviction. Thoreau speaks of our enforced certainties as signifying our being convicted. Similarly, when in the following sections of the investigation, section 124, we are told that philosophy leaves everything as it is. I interpret this as speaking to what Heidegger means by openness as letting lie before us, namely as charging that philosophy is called for by our inability to leave things as they are, by the violence of thinking, so not as a conservative political position. In this sequence of thoughts about the ordinary, each way in which in philosophizing we come upon ourselves denying our human powers produces a clause in an open-ended mythological description of our lives as an exile making ourselves strange to ourselves, constructing unsatisfying substitutes for a fantasy of lost harmony, or violently asserting a singularity guaranteed by metaphysics rather than by making our words and deeds our own. It, metaphysical insistence, surely another person cannot have this pain, says Wittgenstein, striking oneself on the breast. For philosophers who, in Nietzsche's words, live in contradiction to the present, who link a perception of what they grant to be the actual world with an imagination of an eventual world, there are two ordinaries, two extreme views of human possibility or adoption. Plato calls them illusion and reality. Kant pictures them as the sensible world and the intelligible world. Emerson speaks of the arenas of conformity and of self-reliance. Nietzsche of philistinism and self-overcoming. Heidegger of the world of the inauthentic, transformed by the authentic. Wittgenstein's promise of peace or rest after restlessness is in his practice something lost almost as soon as it is found. Not one that projects a place or refuge. So its philosophical stance of contradiction and dissatisfaction in effect assumes an independence from whatever world this imperfect one turns out to be. The specificity of the clauses in Wittgenstein's mythology of the ordinary produces the sense of a continuing effort to recognize the extraordinariness within the ordinariness of our lives and contrarywise. Call it an effort to form a sense of an intuition of the way we live. This effort is confirmed for me by what I've said in the past in characterizing the investigations as a kind of philosophy of culture and as containing a portrait of the modern subject, the former in a little book called uh, this new yet unapproachable America, and the latter in uh, a piece called The Investigation's Aesthetics of Itself. I want to say a word about each of these characterizations. <clears throat> the specific, the, sorry. And my idea of philosophical investigations as a response to a description and criticism of its culture, which I'm there juxtaposing with Spengler's response in his Decline of the West, a text which is well known to have left a mark on the generation of European intellectuals that includes Wittgenstein and Heidegger, born the same year. That idea of the investigations as an odd description of its culture as suggested conceiving its sections in their discontinuities and their continuities as fragments representing details of a complete sophisticated culture. I accordingly was led to characterize its movement in these details as 
quoting myself now, from the scene and consequences of inheritance and instruction and fascination and the request for an apple and the building of what might seem the first building, to the possibility of the loss of attachment as such to the inheritance, a loss of attachment to our own words, as the seeing as passage in the investigation says it's going to uh, investigate. Uh, and these moments as tracked by the struggle of philosophy with itself, with the losing and turning of one's way and chronic outbreaks of frenzy. I go on to concede that it's not clear that we can imagine philosophical investigations as such a portrait, but I then add that it should not essentially be harder than following Wittgenstein's direction in one of the earliest of sections of philosophical invest investigations to conceive of this, namely a language consisting of four words for all the world, as a complete primitive language. I say it should be no harder to do than that on the assumption I make that this means conceiving it as the expression of a complete primitive culture. This is part of the significance in my having reported myself imagining the builders as moving and speaking sluggishly, the way I imagined earlier hominids moving and communicating, taking it that what we mean by a culture shapes the self-presentations of its members from their gates to their threats and from their temptations to their shows of satisfaction. I should make explicit as a point of difference, real or imagined, in my reading of the investigations that the way I epitomized a moment ago certain details of the culture it represents, beginning by citing a scene of inheritance and fascination and instruction, is meant to stress that figure of the child implied, as I mentioned yesterday, far more often than in the dozen or two sections uh, or citations that an index may include, namely in all of its references to ideas of instruction. How the child is imagined to be treated is a fateful matter, bearing, for example, on nothing less than Wittgenstein's response to skepticism. I mentioned also in my first lecture that when Saul Kripke interprets the passage that I call the scene of instruction in the investigations, when I have exhausted the justifications, uh, my, and I have reached bedrock, and my spade is turned, then I'm inclined to say, this is simply what I do. That's what I mean by the scene of instruction. Kripke takes power in this struggle, as I said, to reside on just one side, the teachers, the one undertaking to speak for the culture. And since it is seen as a power of exclusion, it is to be conceived as tied to political power. Kripke refers to Wittgenstein's imagining that if a child does not respond to the suggested gesture, it is separated from the others and treated as a lunatic. That idea is broached, those are Wittgenstein's words, in Wittgenstein's Brown book, one of two recognizable sets of sketches for philosophical investigation, but not, I believe, repeated in the investigations. I've called the idea Wittgenstein's Swiftian proposal, implying fairly obviously, I thought, that Wittgenstein's attitude towards the proposal was roughly Jonathan Swift's toward his modest proposal, quoting Swift, for preventing the children of poor people in Ireland from being a burden to their parents or country and for making them beneficial to the public, unquote, by establish criteria, establishing a criteria for separating out a portion of the children at a certain point of their lives to be prepared as food. I do not mean to say that Wittgenstein's descriptions or discoveries in this area do not raise the issue of a culture's distribution of power. So do Swift's. Only that they do not settle how close our actual actions are to this Swiftian proposal. Kripke takes, this is what I am inclined to do, which is, I think, importantly, not exactly what Wittgenstein says. He says, this is what I am inclined to say. I take, this is what I am inclined to do, uh, to be, in Kripke's uh, text, a strong announcement implying something like, do it my way or suffer the consequences. I don't deny the possibility to recall what I said. Uh, but uh, I do not deny the possibility. But to recall what I said, I find it at least as plausible to take 
then I'm inclined to say this is simply what I do, in which, as I said, perhaps nothing is imagined actually to be said, to be a weak announcement, even passive, implying something like, I cannot see here where or how to make myself plainer, but here I am doing what I do whenever you find you are interested again. I do not, that is to say, but otherwise, find that the case generalizes, generalizes into a surmise, let alone a thesis, of skepticism, since the little myth of instruction strikes me as asking that we take crises or limits of learning case by case, asking ourselves how important it is that we agree here, and how thoroughly, in various strains of our form or forms of life, and where we may, or can, or ought to, or must, tolerate differences, even perhaps be drawn to change our lives or suffer the consequences. Illumination by mythical description has its limits. It is for Wittgenstein and not, as I have said for Austin, essential to his philosophizing to account for a certain philosophical vulnerability to or insistence upon nonsense. And though the capacity for defeating sense is the same as that for making sense and serves its own wishes, I said, as though that, those capacities are the same. I shall not try to repeat here my understanding of the role of criteria in connection with grammar in the investigations, as developed in a book of mine called The Claim of Reason, except to say that I take Wittgenstein's idea of criteria as meant to account both for the depth of our sharing of language and at the same time for our power to refuse this legacy from time to time in specific ways, to account for, as I put it, both the possibility and the recurrent threat or coherence of skepticism. To possess criteria is also to possess the demonic power to strip them from ourselves, to turn language upon itself, to find that its criteria are in relation to others, relation to others, merely outer, in relation to certainty, merely blind, in relation to being able to go on with our concepts into new contexts, wholly ungrounded. Our knack with criteria is shown by Wittgenstein in scores of instances or reminders, sometimes one so plain as expecting someone to tea, for which our criteria are such obvious matters as checking your watch, putting on water to boil, setting the table, which implies the less plain matter of the existence of a context in which someone is to be expected. Matters which we are given to understand will be connected with criteria for creating an expectation, or with those for an impulsive invitation, or an impulsive acceptance of an invitation, and for awaiting someone impatiently, and for being disappointed at a failure of someone to appear, and so on, and so on. All obvious, better be obvious, since they're all the things we know. But Wittgenstein reveals at the same time our power to question the power of such criteria in judging the world. For example, by finding ourselves pressed to ask whether expecting isn't really a particular feeling, say the one developed in waiting in the dark with others for the birthday person to open the door upon a surprise party, so that either the concept expressed in the ordinary world expect is word expecting is basically, inherently, irreducibly vague or grossly conventional in its reference to a variety of behaviors. Or else there really is no such thing as expecting, but at best a collection of unnamed, perhaps unnameable inclinations. If I say to myself then, still, I know what expecting is, I'm at the verge of an intellectual crisis. It is not I who know this. This is what expecting is. Everyone knows it, except evidently for some people. Against this sense of stripping or forgetting ourselves, I sometimes find certain of Wittgenstein's famous terms of criticism insufficiently helpful, such as his speaking of our running our heads up against the limits of language, uh, or being misled by grammar, which may carry the suggestion that such limits and what he means by grammar are fixed. 
I tend rather to emphasize in the investigations other features uh, of what I speak of as its implied sketch of the modern subject, namely one who is subject to the philosophical aspirations and perplexities depicted in those fragments of the investigations. These further features seem to me better to draw out my interest in Wittgenstein's text. <clears throat> <clears throat> In the course of working on what I called the investigation's aesthetics of itself, I typically identified eight or nine characteristics that the text implicitly attributes to this, what I'm calling, modern subject. I've already here cited specific passages implying the lostness, exile, devastation of that subject. Now I add a fourth, I mentioned it already also, strangeness, as when he says, 38, the strange conception of what a name is comes from a tendency, a tendency, our tendencies, talking about us, to sublime the language of, uh, the logic of our language as one might say. Something I, I uh, identify uh, with the desire to speak outside language games. There's a fifth concept, a sense of disappointment with human speech or with the criteria we share in sharing a world. As when Wittgenstein says, a name ought really to signify a simple 39, which pairs sixth with perverseness when Wittgenstein says, why does it occur to one to want to make precisely this word into a name when it evidently is not a name? And he replies, that is just the reason. Which suggests that seven, sickness, that's when he says, the philosopher's treatment of a question is like the treatment of an illness, 255, is understood both as a sickness of the understanding and a sickness of the will. He says, philosophical problems are solved through an insight into language despite a drive to misunderstand them, 109. An eighth characteristic of the subject is a fear of suffocation, of inexpressiveness, I've put it. He says, the ideal in our thoughts is unshakable. You can never get outside it. Outside, you cannot breathe. A ninth is torment says, the real discovery is one that gives philosophy peace so that it is no longer tormented by questions which bring itself in question. 133. I speak of the drive to speak outside language games also uh, as a desire to speak absolutely, a formulation derived from the translation of Wittgenstein's remarking at 47, it makes no sense at all to speak absolutely of the simple parts of the chair. So how are we to understand what presents itself in the investigations is our drive to senselessness, our demonic threat to carry ourselves away. My first way of putting the matter, the matter as I formulated earlier of the restlessness of the finite creature, was in my first effort to respond to Wittgenstein's later philosophy, to identify at a minimum two voices in philosophical investigations. The voice of temptation, quoting that early piece, the voice of temptation and the voice of correctness are the antagonists in Wittgenstein's dialogues. It's been suggested to me that voice of correctness here should be changed to voice of correction. That's not a bad idea, but in thus emphasizing society's resemblance to a prison, correction, rather than to a schoolroom correctness. It may push too hard to fix the power between generations, the power of recruiting resistant new natives of our tongue, since society has, more or less convincingly, also been thought to resemble a hospital, a madhouse, a circus, a herd, a hell, a kaleidoscope, a chorus, a mob, a body, an arcade. In any case, 
the voices were not meant to exhaust what I'm calling the modern subject sketched in and by the text, which is capable, in addition, of producing and appreciating its humor, its pathos, its parables, its aphorisms, respites from its antagonistic voices, momentary respites. A more recent instance in my sequence of efforts to register human or mortal restlessness is to distinguish in Wittgenstein's often cited invocation of forms of life between a social or conventional or horizontal direction where differences between dining and snacking may be significant, with a biological or natural or vertical direction where differences between eating and feeding or between tables and troughs are to the point. And the importance of the distinction, beyond cautioning against what I believe is the more common, over to my mind, conventionalized language uh, reception of Wittgenstein, concentrating more on our capacity to construct language games than on our desire to break free of our disappointment with our constructions may emerge if we pressed Wittgenstein's idea of philosophy as a form of presenting the natural history of the human, notably marked to my mind in the investigations by the remarkable number of animals and insects for a work of philosophy depicted in its text, from the fly and the lion to one or more beetles and a goose and a dog and two cows. For the distinction of directions in life forms suggests that the human is the one that is unnatural, fated to dissatisfaction with its lot, to torment, to disappointment, exile, and the rest. Unless you wish to say that the compulsion to escape the human lot, to overcome the human, risking monstrousness, is precisely what is natural to the human. It is, I judge, inevitable that in periods of distance from the text of philosophical investigations, one will recur to the sense that the matters I've stressed here of myth and symbolic expression are really matters of style. They don't seem that way when one's immersed in the investigations. And then I recall two passages in part two, in part two of what now appears as philosophical investigations. First passage is, I should like to say that what dawns here lasts only as long as I am occupied with the object in a particular way. In which case, we have to answer the question, uh, how did he fall upon that style? What's it doing? If one assumes, however, that philosophy serves reason best in thinking of itself in connection with science, then perhaps the problem of style will not arise. Only once have I attempted, I think, to start something like an argument to show that for Wittgenstein, as I put the matter, it is part of philosophy's dedication to reason to account for its literary conditions. What I call something like an argument for the presence of the literary, say for the need of the understanding it provides, is the burden of that essay on the aesthetics of itself, um, where the idea of a Perspicuous presentation, who resists the Darstellung, Wittgenstein says, namely, uh, the thing that Wittgenstein marks as his form of presentation of his investigations at 122 can be seen to apply not alone to what he calls in his signature philosophical procedures of grammatical investigations, as for example, his investigations into the concepts of reading or of a game, or of being able to do something, or of knowing how to go on, or of something's being simple, or of the difference between saying something and being inclined or tempted to say something. Perspicuous presentation applies not just to such matters, I'm suggesting, but applies as well to the extremist and characteristic forms of the literary in the investigations, namely, let's call them the aphorism and the parable, as when he writes, the human body is our best picture of the human soul. Or writes, a smiling mouth smiles only in a human face. The criteria I emphasize in identifying such instances as perspicuous is that they provide pleasure, 
that they compose a distinct unity, and that they break off a line of thought. So do grammatical investigations. In the investigations, accordingly, aphorism and parable equally represent, with the methods of language games, instances of the moments of peace philosophy can achieve. But while their words are ordinary, they require something more than an ordinary command of language to produce. They do not continue, but at least for the moment, stop conversation. This specifies an asymmetry between the roles, not, of course, always between the persons, in a philosophical exchange. The same between those who are in a position to open and to close the exchange and those who are not. It would follow that the epitomizing of the literary in the investigations is necessary to it, not merely possible for it, however, only if it were also shown that something Wittgenstein wants from philosophizing is given in no other way, in particular not by grammatical investigations. For example, what grammatical investigations achieve through their criteria is, I have claimed, disappointing suggesting an irreducible capacity for disappointment in the human makeup. Further grammatical investigations will not be expected to speak to this capacity. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Almost home. But if I say that the distortion in underestimating the writing in philosophical investigations is as great as my overestimating it here may seem to be, this is perhaps still not to decide whether the writing is to be understood as prior or subsequent to the philosophy it manifests. And here my career-long wish for the work I do to be answerable to professional philosophy means that I take it as correct that pedagogically Wittgenstein belongs wherever else in departments of philosophy and specifically departments of analytical philosophy that his work cannot fully live intellectually outside their attention. My question is whether his work can fully live intellectually inside their possession. One way to understand the pedagogical recalcitrance of Wittgenstein's text is to consider that it challenges the fairly fundamental professional assumption that philosophy breaks into separate fields of study. Heidegger is the only philosopher I think of who has explicitly described himself as shunning the idea of philosophy or not caring about the idea of philosophy as a set of fields. Too bad for which side of that? I am responding to this challenge to the separation of philosophical fields when, briefly, I speak of the investigation's idea of the solution of a philosophical problem as requiring or inviting an aesthetic interpretation. And when, even more briefly, I've suggested that the fervor or urgency of insight that Wittgenstein's writing demands, the air of importance he conveys, while at the same time seeming to destroy importance, is to be understood as a form of moral perfectionism. It is as if Austin's toying with the idea of original sin by putting in his own voice a lost garden in conjunction with Barclay's example of the apple and the unperceived tree is in philosophical investigations given a philosophically serious secular articulation. Human talkers always tormented by possibilities untaken, forever cast down in taking them. A word now in conclusion about Wittgenstein's encouragement to think of his philosophical methods as like therapies, which some philosophers of my acquaintance have been discouraged by. Taking Wittgenstein's proposal as signaling a wish 
to cure us precisely of the impulse to philosophy. But why take it this way? Like therapies, suggest that a philosophical question or a question asked philosophically is apt to have causes whose origins are not presented, to which a helpful response may be no more like a solution than like a cure, or say no more like finding an answer than like finding a further question. Is it sure that the invitation of therapy is meant to differentiate philosophical investigations from traditional philosophy? More than it is to assume its place in continuing philosophy as if it's in its kinky or discontinuous way. Has not philosophy itself, since at least Plato, claimed for itself the task of therapy, or say liberation from bonds of illusion, superstition, bewitchment, fanaticism, self-distortion? Wittgenstein's difference expressed in his mythological description of his philosophy as destroying houses of cards, Luftgebäude, castles in the air, lies in his sense that philosophical constructions are as apt to mask as to relieve philosophical perplexity, as is each of us has her or his own countless diurnal ways of getting lost and of recognizing help. It would follow that philosophy is over only on the assumption that philosophy is exhausted by metaphysics and that metaphysics is exhausted by the attempt to solve problems generated by a skeptical process. But if metaphysics is to tell us how things are, philosophical procedures otherwise motivated, let's say by wonder, may count as metaphysics, perhaps among them discovering and working out further regions of our natural history, or what we'll be willing to call that. Some will feel that philosophy should get out of the liberation business, or perhaps get on with it by joining the more effective liberation presented in the advances of science. I hope I have never denied that the process of acquiring genuine knowledge may itself be therapeutic. But in recent centuries, philosophy's allegiance to science in my part of the philosophical forest has been in no danger of being lost. Unlike philosophy's intimate argument with, for example, the great and the small arts. My own sense of liberation in encountering philosophical investigations, not at first, when I found it arbitrary, unoriginal, and superficial, was that it freed me to explore whatever experience or text in whatever medium genuinely interested me, seemed to call for my attention, a freedom which my participation in the English-speaking institutionalization of philosophy over the past half century has seemed sometimes, whatever other causes I have for gratitude to it, to wish precisely to forbid me. But otherwise, I have had occasion to notice that in philosophical investigations, philosophy does not begin first, but rather in response there to a moment in Augustine's autobiography, which some will find too passive responsiveness to an ambition for philosophy. I can imagine that it might either lessen or worsen the disapproval of a differently inclined philosopher if I add in closing that my aim, my claim, sorry, to an inheritance from the empirical tradition of philosophy lies not in producing or establishing the justification for points of empirical evidence for a theory, but in demanding from whatever I am moved to say, its capacity to resist the temptation to become lost to the world of my own experience, which would mean to give over my capacity to judge the justice of the world. Thank you for your patience with all of these noises and waters and so forth. I appreciate it very much. Well, it's my great pleasure, not, I have to say, an adulterated pleasure, though, to try to find words, the right words, 
to express, to express adequately our gratitude to Professor Cavell for his two house and lectures. I think the only way I can try to do that is by identifying an impression that they've left me with. And the impression is that of someone who has been speaking under a self-denying ordinance. By self-denying, of course, I don't mean any denial of oneself, but I mean a denial of excess in oneself. Uh, the, the lectures had been, in a certain sense, exercises, as I've listened to them at any rate, in renunciation. Uh, Professor Cavell has an enormous aptitude for, for eloquence, and he has used this eloquence in these two lectures, as indeed in the whole of his philosophical life, to try to defeat the claims of, of exuberance, of excess, of grandiloquence. And perhaps I should simply suggest an, an epigraph to these, uh, to these two lectures. Um, at the beginning of the, uh, of the lectures, uh, uh, Professor Cavell introduced us to, his, to the two tutelary figures, as we might say, under whose aegis he's spoken, Ludwig Wittgenstein and J.L. Austin. And I would just like to introduce an anecdote in the life of, um, of J.L. Austin very familiar, of course, to Professor Cavell, but with any luck, not known to you all, and anyhow worth repeating. Colonel Austin, as he then was, was during the war entrusted by the Supreme um, uh, High Command with the task of, um, uh, of working out the various details of the landing on, upon the shores of Normandy that were to be determined by the character of the beaches. He became, in his very thorough way, the greatest authority upon the gradients of these beaches, upon the constitution of the beaches, upon, upon the interactions between the beaches and the tides, and the interactions between the beaches as they were affected by the tides, and the landing craft that, with any luck, would eventually land upon them. In May 1944, uh, Eisenhower, who was the overseer of this whole operation, summoned all the military commanders who were going to take part in this great operation to a meeting. And some way through this meeting, he called upon Colonel Austin to inform the military commanders the, his findings about the beaches and the limitations that these imposed upon the orders that they would give. He did so. And no sooner had he finished than various generals got up and gave and told Colonel Austin how they saw the matter, told them how they thought the beaches should be dealt with, where they thought the landing should be, and at what hours to make best use of what they thought about the beaches. And Colonel Austin listened them out. And then he spoke in that very special voice which he perfected. It was a voice which seemed to completely renounce one quality of the human voice, that is to say, intonation. And it had this peculiar and absolutely devastating flatness to it. And he said that he was interested in these comments. But he said, the trouble with all you generals, he said, it isn't that you try to run before you can walk, but that you try to walk before you can even crawl. I think if we substituted uh, philosophers for generals, we have one small theme that has run through these lectures and from which we, at any rate, have something to learn. Thank you very much indeed.